Chapter 10 of The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 10. The Steamer. I awoke with a start, and with wavering eyes looked at the saloon clock. I had slept for one hour only, but it appeared to me that I was quite refreshed. My mind was strangely clear, every sense preternaturally alert. I began to wonder what had aroused me. Suddenly the ship shuddered through the very heart of her, and I knew that it was this shuddering which must have occurred before that awakened me. "'Good God, we're sinking!' a man cried. He was in the next berth to me, and he sat up, staring wildly. "'Rubbish,' I answered. The electric lights went out, and we were left with the miserable illumination of one little swinging oil lamp. Immediately the score or so persons in the saloon were afoot and rushing about, grasping their goods and chattels. The awful shuddering of the ship continued. Scarcely a word was spoken. A man flew, or rather tumbled, down the saloon stairs, shouting, Where's my wife? Where's my wife? No one took the slightest notice of him, nor did he seem to expect any answer. Even in the semi-darkness of the single lamp, I distinctly saw that with both hands he was tearing handfuls of hair from his head. I'd heard the phrase, tearing one's hair, some thousands of times in my life, but never till that moment had I witnessed the action itself. Somehow it made an impression on me. The man raced round the saloon, still shouting, and raced away again upstairs and out of sight. Everyone followed him pell-mell, helter-skelter, and almost in a second I found myself alone. I put on my overcoat and my Macintosh over that, and, seizing Rosa's jewel box, I followed the crowd. As I emerged on deck, a Bengal light flared red and dazzling on the bridge, and I saw some sailors trying to lower a boat from its davits. Then I knew that the man who cried, We are sinking, even if he was not speaking the exact truth, had at any rate some grounds for his assertion. A rather pretty girl, pale with agitation, seized me by the buttonhole. Where are we going? she questioned earnestly. Don't know, madam, I replied, and then the young man dragged her off by the arm. Come this way, Lottie, I heard him say to her, and keep calm. I was left staring at the place where the girl's head had been. Then the head of an old man filled that place. I saw his mouth and all his features working in frantic endeavour to speak to me, but he could not articulate. I stepped aside. I could not bear to look at him. Carl, I said to myself, you are undoubtedly somewhat alarmed, but you are not in such an absolutely as your funk as that old chap. Pull yourself together. Of what followed immediately I have no recollection. I knew vaguely that the ship rolled and had a serious list to starboard that orders were being hoarsely shouted from the bridge, that the moon was shining fitfully, that the sea was black and choppy. I also seemed to catch the singing of a hymn somewhere on the forward deck. I suppose I knew that I existed. But that was all. I had no exact knowledge of what I myself was doing. There was a hiatus in my consciousness of myself. The proof of this is that, after a lapse of time, I suddenly discovered that I had smoked halfway through a cigarette, and that I was at the bows of the steamer. For a million sovereigns I could not explain under what circumstances I had moved from one end of the ship to the other, nor how I had come to light that cigarette. Such is the curious effect of perturbation. But the perturbation had now passed from me, just as mysteriously as it had overtaken me. I was cool and calm. I felt inquisitive, and I asked several people what had happened. But none seemed to know. In fact, they scarcely heard me, and answered wildly, as if in delirium. It seemed strange that anything could have occurred on so small a vessel without the precise details being common property. Yet so it was, and those who had been in an accident at sea will support me when I say that the ignorance on the part of the passengers of the events actually in progress is not the least astounding nor the least disconcerting item in such an affair. It was the psychology of the railway accident repeated. I began to observe. The weather was a little murky, but beyond doubt still improving. The lights of the French coast could clearly be seen. The ship rolled in a short sea. Her engines had stopped. She still had the formidable list to starboard. The captain was on the bridge leaning over, and with his hands round his mouth was giving orders to an officer below. The sailors were still struggling to lower the boat from the davits. The passengers stood about, aimless, perhaps terror-struck but now, for the most part, quiet and self-contained. Some of them had life-belts. 
That was the sum of my observations. A rocket streamed upwards into the sky, and another, and another. Then one caught the rigging, and deflected whizzed down again within a few feet of my head, and dropped on deck, spluttering in a silly, futile way. I threw the end of my cigarette at it, to see whether that might help it along. So this is a shipwreck, I ejaculated, and I'm in it. I've got myself safely off the railway, only to fall into the sea. What a damn shame! Quickly enough, I had ceased to puzzle myself with trying to discover how the disaster had been brought about. I honestly made up my mind that we were sinking, and that was sufficient. What cursed ill luck, I murmured philosophically. I thought of Rosa, with whom I was to have breakfasted on the morrow, whose jewels I was carrying, whose behest it had been my pleasure to obey. At that moment, she seemed to me, in my mind's eye, more beautiful, of a more exquisite charm, than ever before. Am I going to lose her? I murmured. And then, what a sensation there'll be in the papers if this ship does go down. My brain flitted from point to point in a quick agitation. I decided suddenly that the captain and crew must be a set of nincompoops who had lost their heads and, not knowing what to do, were unserenely doing nothing. And quite as suddenly I reversed my decision and reflected that no doubt the captain was doing precisely the correct thing and that the crew were loyal and disciplined. Then my mind returned to Rosa. What would she say, what would she feel, when she learnt that I had been drowned in the channel? Would she experience a grief merely platonic, or had she indeed a profounder feeling towards me? Drowned? Who said drowned? There were the boats, if they could be launched, and moreover I could swim. I considered what I should do at the moment the ship foundered, for I still felt she would founder. I was the blackest of pessimists. I said to myself that I would spring as far as I could into the sea, not only to avoid the sucking in of the vessel, but to get clear of the other passengers. Suppose that a passenger who could not swim should by any chance seize me in the water. How should I act? This was a conundrum. I could not save another and myself too. I said I would leave that delicate point till the time came, but in my heart I knew that I should beat off such a person with all the savagery of despair, unless it happened to be a woman. I felt that I could not repulse a drowning woman, even if to help her for a few minutes meant death for both of us. How insignificant seemed everything else, everything outside the ship and the sea and our perilous plight. The death of Aresca, the jealousy of Carlotta de Champ, the plot, if there was one, against Rosa. What were these matters to me? But Rosa was something. She was more than something. She was all. A lovely, tantalising vision of her appeared to float before my eyes. I peered over the port rail to see whether we were, in fact, gradually sinking. The heaving water looked a long way off, and the idea of this raised my spirits for an instant. But only for an instant. The apparent inactivity of those in charge annoyed what it saddened me. They were not even sending up rockets now, nor burning Bengal lights. I had no patience left to ask more questions. A mood of disgust seized me. If the captain himself had stood by my side waiting to reply to requests for information, I doubt if I should have spoken. I felt like the spectator who is compelled to witness a tragedy which both wounds and bores him. I was obsessed by my own ill luck and the stupidity of the rest of mankind. I was particularly annoyed by the spasmodic hymn-singing that went on in various parts of the deck. The man who had burst into the saloon shouting, Where is my wife? reappeared from somewhere, and standing next to me started to undress hastily. I watched him. He had taken off his coat, waistcoat and boots, when a quiet, amused voice said, I shouldn't do that if I were you. It's rather chilly, you know. Besides, think of the ladies. Without a word, he began with equal celerity to reassume his clothes. I turned to the speaker. It was the youth who had dragged the girl away from me when I first came up on deck. She was on his arm, and had a rug over her head. Both were perfectly self-possessed. The serenity of the young man's face particularly struck me. I was not to be outdone. Have a cigarette, I said. Thanks. Do you happen to know what all this business is? I asked him. It's a collision, he said. We were struck on the port paddle-box. That saved us for the moment. How did it occur? Then know. And where's the ship that struck us? Oh, somewhere over there, two or three miles away. 
he pointed vaguely to the northeast. You see, half the paddle wheel was knocked off, and when that sank, of course, the port side rose out of the water. I believe those paddle wheels weigh a deuce of a lot. Are we going to sink? Don't know. Can't tell you more in half an hour. I've got two life belts hidden under a seat. They're rather a nuisance to carry about. You're shivering, Lottie. You must take some more exercise. See you later, sir. And the two went off again. The girl had not looked at me, nor I at her. She did not seem to be interested in our conversation. As for her companion, he restored my pride in my race. I began to whistle. Suddenly the whistle died on my lips, standing exactly opposite to me on the starboard side. Was the mysterious being whom I had last seen in the railway carriage at Sittingbourne. He was, as usual, imperturbable, sardonic, terrifying. His face, which chanced to be lighted by the rays of a deck lantern, had the pallor and the immobility of marble, and the dark eyes held me under their hypnotic gaze. Again, I had the sensation of being victimised by a conspiracy of which this implacable man was the head. I endured once more the mental tortures which I had suffered in the railway carriage, and now, as then, I felt helpless and bewildered. It seemed to me that his existence overshadowed mine, and if in some way he was connected with the death of Alresca. Possibly there was a plot, in which the part played by the jealousy of Carlotta Deschamps was only a minor one. Possibly I had unwittingly stepped into a net of subtle intrigue, of the extent of whose boundaries and ramifications I had not the slightest idea. Like one set in the blackness of an unfamiliar chamber, I feared to, to step forward or backward, lest I might encounter some unknown horror. It may be argued that I must have been in a highly nervous condition in order to be affected in such a manner by the mere sight of a man, a man who had never addressed to me a single word of conversation. Perhaps so. Yet, up to that period of my life, my temperament and habit of mind had been calm, unimpressionable, and, if I may say so, not specially absurd. What need to inquire how the man had got on board the ship, how he had escaped death in the railway accident, how he had eluded my sight at David Priory? There he stood. Evidently he had purposed to pursue me to Paris, and little things like railway collisions were insufficient to, to deter him. I surmised that he must have quitted the compartment at sitting morn immediately after me, meaning to follow me, but that the starting of the train had prevented him from entering the same compartment as I entered. According to this theory, he must have jumped into another compartment lower down the train as the train was moving, and left it when the collision occurred, keeping his eye on me all the time, but not coming forward. He must even have walked after me down the line from Dover Priory to the pier. However, a shipwreck was a more serious affair than a railway accident, and if the ship were indeed doomed, it would have puzzled even him to emerge with his life. He might seize me in the water, and from simple hate drag me to destruction. Yes, that was just what he would do, but he would have a difficulty in saving himself. Such were my wild and fevered notions. On the starboard bow I saw the dim bulk and the masthead lights of a steamer approaching us. The other passengers had observed it too, and there was a buzz of anticipation on the slanting deck. Only the inimical man opposite to me seemed to ignore the stir. He did not even turn round to look at the object which had aroused the general excitement. His eyes never left me. The vessel came nearer, till we could discern clearly the outline of her, and a black figure on her bridge. She was not more than a hundred yards away when the beat of her engine stopped. She hailed us. We waited for the answering call from our own captain, but there was no reply. Twice again she hailed us, and was answered only by silence. "'Why don't our people reply?' an old lady asked, who came up to me at that moment, breathing heavily. "'Because they're damn fools,' I said roughly. She was a most respectable and prim old lady, yet I could not resist shocking her ears by an impropriety. The other ship moved away into the night. "'Was I in a dream? Was this a pantomime shipwreck?' Then it occurred to me that the captain was so sure of being ultimately able to help himself that he preferred, from motives of economy, to decline assistance which would involve a heavy salvage claim. My self-possessed young man came along again in the course of his peregrinations, the girl whom he called Lottie still on his arm. He stopped for a chat. Most curious thing, he began. What now? Well, I found out about the collision. 
How did it occur? In this way, the captain was on duty on the bridge with the steersman at the wheel. It was thickish weather then, much thicker than it is now. In fact, there should be no breeze left, and look at the stars. Suddenly, the lookout man shouted that there was a sail on the weather bow, and it must have been pretty close too. The captain ordered the man at the wheel to put the boat to port. I don't know the exact phraseology of the thing, so that we could pass the other ship on our starboard side. Instead of doing that, the triple idiot shoved us to starboard as hard as he could, and before the captain could do anything, we were struck on the port paddle. The steersman had sent us right into the other ship. If he wanted specially to land us into a good smash-up, he could scarcely have done it better. A good thing we got caught on the paddle, otherwise we should have been cut clean in two. As it was, the other boat recoiled and fell away. Was she damaged? Probably not. How does the man at the wheel explain his action? Well, that's the curious part. I was just coming to that. Naturally, he's in a great state of terror just now, but he can just talk. He swears that when the captain gave his order, a third person ran up the steps leading to the bridge, and so frightened him that he was sort of dazed and did exactly the wrong thing. A queer tale. I should think so, but he sticks to it. He even says that this highly mysterious third person made him do the wrong thing. But that's absolute Tommy rot. Now the man must be mad. I should have said he'd been drunk, but there doesn't seem to be any trace of that. Anyhow, he sees visions, and I maintain that the Chatham and Dover people oughtn't to have their boats steered by men who see visions, eh? I agree with you. I suppose we aren't now in any real danger. Well, I should hardly think so. We might have been. It was pure luck that we happened to get struck on the paddle box, and also it was pure luck that the sea had gone down so rapidly. With a list like this, a really lively cross sea would soon have settled us. We were silent for a few moments. The girl looked idly round the ship, and her eyes encountered the figure of the mysterious man. She seemed to shiver. Oh, she exclaimed under her breath, what a terrible face that man has. Where, said her friend, over there. And how is it he's wearing a silk hat, here? His glance followed hers, but my follower had turned abruptly round, and in a moment was moving quickly to the after part of the ship. He passed behind the smokestack and was lost to our view. The back of him looks pretty stiff, the young man said. I wonder if he's the chap that alarmed the man at the wheel. I laughed, and at the same time I accidentally dropped Rosa's jewel case, which had never left my hand. I picked it up hurriedly. You seem attached to that case, the young man said, smiling. If we had found it, should you have let it go, or tried to swim ashore with it? The question is doubtful. I replied, returning his smile. In shipwrecks, one soon becomes intimate with strangers. If I mistake not, it's a jewel case. It is a jewel case. He nodded with a moralising air, as if reflecting upon the sordid love of property which will make a man carry a jewel case about with him when the next moment he might find himself in the sea. At least, that was my interpretation of the nodding. Then the brother and sister, for such I afterwards discovered they were, left me to take care of my jewel case alone. Why had I dropped the jewel case? Was it because I was startled by the jocular remark which identified the mysterious man with the person who had disturbed the steersman? That remark was made in mere jest. Yet I could not help thinking that it contained the truth. Nay, I knew that it was true. I knew by instinct. And, being true, what facts were logically to be deduced from it? What aim had this mysterious man in compelling, by his strange influences, the innocent sailor to guide the ship towards destruction, the ship in which I happened to be a passenger? And then there was a railway accident. The stoker had said that the engine driver had been dazed, like the steersman. But no, there are avenues of conjecture from which the mind shrinks. I could not follow up that train of thought. Happily, I did not see my enemy again, at least during that journey and my mind was diverted, for the dawn came, the beautiful September dawn. Never have I greeted the sun with deeper joy, and I fancied that my sentiments were shared by everyone on board the vessel. As the light spread over the leaden waters, and the coast of France was silhouetted against the sky, the passengers seemed to understand that danger was over, and that we had been through peril and escaped. Some threw themselves upon their knees and prayed with an ecstasy of thankfulness. Others recommenced their hymning. 
Others laughed rather hysterically and began to talk at a prodigious rate. A few, like myself, stood silent and apparently unmoved. Then the engines began to beat. There was a frightful clatter of scrap iron and wood in the port paddle box, and they stopped immediately. Whereupon we noticed that the list of the vessel was somewhat more marked than before. The remainder of the port paddle had, in fact, fallen away into the water. The hymn singers ceased their melodies, absorbed in anticipating what would happen next. At last, after many orders and goings to and fro, the engine started again. This time, of course, the starboard paddle, deeply immersed, moved by itself. We progressed with infinite slowness and in a most peculiar manner. But we did progress, and that was the main thing. The passengers cheered heartily. We appeared to go in curves, but each curve brought us nearer to Calais. As we approached that haven of refuge, it seemed as if every steamer and smack of Calais was coming out to meet us. The steamers whistled, the owners of smacks bawled and shouted. They desired to assist, for were we not disabled, and would not the English railway company pay well for help so gallantly rendered? Our captain, however, made no sign, and, like a wounded, sullen animal, from whom its companions timidly keep a respectful distance, we at length entered Calais Harbour, and by dint of much seamanship and polyglottic swearing, brought up safely at the quay. Then it was that one fully perceived, with a feeling of shame, how night had magnified the seriousness of the adventure, how it had been nothing after all, how it would not fill more than half a column in the newspapers, how the officers of the ship must have despised the excited foolishness of passengers who would not listen to reasonable, commonplace explanations. The boat was evacuated in the twinkling of an eye. I had never seen a channel steamer so quickly empty itself. It was as though the people were stricken by a sudden impulse to dash away from the poor craft at any cost. At the customs, amid all the turmoil and bustle, I saw neither my young friend and his sister, nor my enemy, who so far had clung to me on my journey. I learned that a train would start in about a quarter of an hour. I had some coffee and a roll of the buffet. While I was consuming that trifling refection, the young man and his sister joined me. The girl was taciturn as before, but her brother talked cheerfully as he sipped her chocolate. He told me that his name was Watts, and he introduced his sister. He had a pleasant but rather weak face, and as for his manner and bearing, I could not decide in my own mind whether he was a gentleman or a buyer from some London drapery warehouse on his way to the city of Modes. He gave no information as to his profession or business, and, as I had not even returned his confidence by revealing my name, this was not to be wondered at. "'Are you going on to Paris?' he said presently. "'Yes, and the sooner I get there, the better I shall be pleased.' "'Exactly,' he smiled. "'I'm going too. I've crossed the Channel many times, but I've never before had such an experience as last night's.' Then we began to compare notes of previous voyages, until a railway official entered the buffet with a raucous, Voyageur pour Paris en voiture! There was only one first class carriage, and into this I immediately jumped and secured a corner. Mr. Watts followed me and took the other corner of the same seat. Miss Watts remained on the platform. It was a corridor carriage, and the corridor happened to be on the far side from the platform. Mr. Watts went out to explore the corridor. I arranged myself in my seat, placed the jewel case by my side, and my mackintosh over my knees. Miss Watts stood idly in front of the carriage door, tapping the platform with her umbrella. "'You do not accompany your brother, then?' I ventured. "'No, I'm staying in Calais, where I have a, an engagement,' she smiled plaintively at me. Mr. Watts came back into the compartment, and, standing on the steps, said good-bye to his sister and embraced her. She kissed him affectionately. Then, having closed the carriage door, he stolidly resumed his seat, which was on the other side, away from the door. We had the compartment to ourselves. A nice girl, I reflected. The train whistled, and a porter ran along to put the catches on all the doors. Good-bye, we're off, I said to Miss Watts. Monsieur, she said and her face seemed to flush in the cold morning light. Monsieur! Was she then French to address me like that? She made a gesture as if she would say something to me of importance, and I put my head out of the window. May I ask you to keep an eye on my brother? she whispered. In what way? I asked, somewhat astonished. 
The train began to move, and she walked to keep level with me. Do not let him drink at any of the railway buffets on the journey. He will be met at the Gare du Nord. He is addicted. But how can I stop him if he wants to? She had an appealing look, and she was running now to keep pace with the train. Ah, do what you can, sir. I ask it as a favour. Pardon the request from a perfect stranger. I nodded acquiescence, and, waving my farewell to the poor girl, sank back into my seat. This is a nice commission, I thought. Mr. Watts was no longer at his corner. Also, my jewel case was gone. A deliberate plant, I exclaimed, and I could not help admiring the cleverness with which it had been carried out. I rushed into the corridor and looked through every compartment, but Mr. Watts, whom I was to keep from drunkenness, had utterly departed. Then I made for the handle of the communication cord. It had been neatly cut off. The train was now travelling at a good speed, and the first stop would be Amiens. I was too ashamed of my simplicity to give the news of my loss to the other passengers in the carriage. Very smart indeed, I murmured, sitting down. And I smiled, for after all, I could afford to smile. End of chapter 10